read the portion of Scripture from the Bible that I'm going to be speaking about. And in the Bible, in the book of Nehemiah, they always stood in respect for the Word of God as the Word of God was read. And that's how we lift up the Bible. We don't lift it up as religion, per se. We lift it up as a relationship with the Lord. If you want to turn in your Bible to the Gospel of Luke, the 18th chapter, you can, or you can just read it on the PowerPoint on our screen. Verse 9 of Luke, the 18th chapter, says, Also, he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice in a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Father, we ask today that you would simply hide me behind the cross of Calvary. I really do not want my words or my thoughts to be remembered, but Father, the Holy Spirit seeks to bring to mind the words of Christ, and we want to glorify Jesus Christ today. In all things, we want him to have the preeminence, and we do know that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So if anything good will happen today, it will be because your word has been spoken. Thank you for this group of great people here, Lord. Bless them abundantly. We ask it in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. You can be seated, folks. Do you all realize that you are hated? Do you realize that? Oh, you thought I meant because you're Christians. I, I mean because you're Patriots fans. <laughs> we, we, are, we are hated across the country, whether you know it or not. Nobody likes a winner, you know. And we even have some small children who are embracing other teams in our midst. And we are trying to brainwash, we're trying to change their minds so that they might push aside the Miami Dolphins and start being Patriots fans. But uh, it's fun. I grew up, every team I ever watched was a losing team. You know, every single one. You know, you're all excited, you get excited about the Red Sox. I mean, I went through all the low years watching the Red Sox. But it's nice to be able to watch a winner and to see everybody annoyed by that. You know, I, I've waited so long, I didn't know if I'd hear about it in the nursing home one day. Thank God I made it, that I didn't have to wait till then. Anyway, that has nothing to do with my message today, but I just thought I would throw that in. Today, we're doing a series called Enemies of the Heart. Last week, we talked about anger. And we understood that if we allow anger to fester in our hearts and minds, it can turn into bitterness. And we understand that anger is a choice. It's how we respond to what takes place. Because trust me, bad things are going to happen in the world. There's going to be adversity. There's going to be challenges and problems that will cause us to be stressed and anxious. But it's all how we respond to that. So anger is an enemy of the heart, if not dealt with correctly. Today I've entitled the message, The Comparison Trap. And any of you who check out your pastor to see if his messages are truly original, you can Google The Comparison Trap, and this title has been used 19,000 times. But the message has not been. So I thought, why not go with those 19,000? It must mean something. It must be good, you know. So the title's the same, but the points are different, and I think God's going to show us some things this morning 
uh, that will bless your heart and help us when we seek to compare. And whether you know it or not, every person sitting in this room this morning compares in one way or another, whether it's conscious or it's in our subconscious, we tend to compare ourselves with others. I couldn't think of a better example than Luke, the 18th chapter, verses 9 to 14, the Pharisee and the publican, and how they were involved in this trap called comparison. The Pharisee compared himself to other people. He compared himself especially to this tax collector. The publican or the tax collector ultimately was comparing himself to God, and that's why he stood afar off, and that's why he was unable to look up into heaven, and that's why he continued to hit himself on his chest. He was so distraught with his own sin and unworthiness, he didn't feel like he could be a part of anything and yet we find out that Jesus Christ commended him. Uh, we have to figure out what we're comparing ourselves with today. If we compare ourselves with people, you'll always find somebody who's not doing as much as you. You'll always find somebody who has more problems than you. Or you'll find somebody who's doing better than you. And sometimes you will weigh how your life is going by the other people that you view and you compare yourself to. The Pharisee, people looked at the Pharisee. We get this parable wrong sometimes. They looked at the Pharisee and they were in awe of him. He wore the right prayer robe. He carried the right book. He walked very spiritually in the way that he walked and the way that he looked up at heaven. He loved to stand on the corner and pray so the people would notice him. He loved to go to the temple and to give because he had more than most people, and really a tithe for him was nothing. So he enjoyed people watching him. He had committed great portions of Scripture to his heart and mind. It was very, very impressive. And people thought the Pharisees were uh, quite exciting to view. The tax collector, the publican, how do you feel about the IRS? You know, are you excited about them? If they leave a message on your voicemail, are you like, wow, I can't wait to get back to them? You know, or if you get a letter in the mail, are you excited about that when you get something from the Internal Revenue Service? I don't think so. The tax collector was despicable. In fact, the tax collector was called a sinner. It's funny, the religious leaders couldn't understand how Jesus ate and drank and had meals with sinners. You see, the religious crowd didn't consider themselves to be sinners. And Christ would look at them and say, it's not the healthy that need a physician, it is the sick who need a physician, so apparently you don't need me. But we know all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And everyone is in need of a Savior. I embraced Jesus Christ when I was 18 years old. And it's, I've made a lot of stupid decisions in my life, but that was not one of them. That was the best decision I ever made to trust the Son of God and to invite Him into my life. My mom actually got the last laugh with all of that because I was very rebellious and I was not into wanting to receive Christ as Savior. And I would see her praying for me when I would come home after I'd been out doing stuff I shouldn't be doing. And I'd laugh. And I'd be like, yeah, pray. <laughs> pray, pray. And then I received Christ. And then God called me into the ministry. And then I started a church on Cape Cod. And my mother became one of the members. And I think she enjoyed sitting there looking at me. You know, almost like, yeah, 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 you know. Uh, it happened just the way I prayed that it would happen. And I thank God that it happened that way also. So understand there's a comparison going on here. If you're comparing yourself to people, circumstances, situations, and not comparing yourself to Jesus, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. God wants us to compare ourselves with Him so that we realize we fall short 
and we are in need of salvation. We're all weak little men and little women in need of a great God. So a couple of things I kind of wrote down, and this is kind of like Ronald Reagan used to do, kind of a fireside chat, you know, as I talked to you this morning. Who am I? Who are you? What am I doing? And according to who do I do what I do? Who am I doing it for? Every day we constantly make comparisons and it almost always dumps us off at the wrong doorstep. When you make comparisons, uh, it usually will not make you happy. It will usually breed discontent, frustration, because most of us tend to look at someone who's doing better. Somebody who has it together. Somebody who's receiving the privileges that we think we should have. And then we evaluate ourselves and we become prideful and we say, I'm better than this. I should be receiving more than this. Sometimes we measure our worth by our skills, our gifts, our attitudes, the results, or by others. What causes us to look around? Do you realize comparison is very tiresome and exhaustive in nature? You get tired looking around and performing for everybody else and wishing sometimes that we were somebody else. I love to say all the time, do what you do for an audience of one, right? Do what you do for an audience of one. Extremely important. Now, the temptation to compare will come with your next conversation of a friend. Your temptation to compare will come the next time you visit Planet Fitness, I go to Planet Fitness and I'm feeling pretty good about myself until this guy walks by. And I'm like, why does he walk like that? You know? And they say, you don't understand. They're built differently. Their muscles get in the way. They can't walk right. They can't swim. They're lucky to be able to get a fork to their mouth, you know, because of those, those big muscles. And I look and I realize I can't compare to them, so I kind of shift and look at people who are older because I'm going to compare myself to them. So I look at the guys on the treadmill. And some of them, you know, they run like girls. And not that some girls don't really run well, you know, like athletes. But I look at some of the older guys and I'm like, I'm better than him. And I can run better than him. And I start comparison, comparing myself with the others who are around me in Planet Fitness. We always find somewhere to compare ourselves. Might not be a good choice of seating there, you know? I don't know if you want to bring your daughter over with you. No? Okay. Um, when you check into Facebook, anybody here do Facebook? Yeah. You almost always feel worse about yourself. Because when people write about themselves, they usually don't tell you what's wrong with themselves or what negative stuff is going on. They tell you how great they are, how wonderful they're doing, their results in ministry, their numbers, the great decisions that were made, the new buildings that were erected. And you look, and if you're doing just okay, you walk away not enjoying life too much. And then other people have nothing to brag about, so this is what they post on Facebook. I am in the living room, and I am walking now into the kitchen. <laughs> Isn't that exciting? You know? I am now out on the deck. You know? I'm taking a moment to go into the bathroom. You know? I'm going to the laundry now. And you read this stuff, and you really feel bad for them. And see, those are the people I like to compare myself to. I'm better than that. I don't say those kind of things. But those are usually not the ones I read. It's the ones that get me angry that kind of come up on the screen. So we always are tempted to compare ourselves with other people, Facebook, social media. It's easy. One writer said this. It's easy to measure the success of others as a reminder of your own shortcomings. When you see other people that are being successful, we compare it. We decide, wow, I'm not doing that, and things are not working out for me in that way. It's never according to God's plan, but it should be. 
Psalm 139, one of my favorite psalms, I read it to the folks at the hospital when they're not feeling good about themselves. We have all types at the hospital, people that self-medicate, people that cut themselves, people who have been abused by moms and dads. And I talk to them about our Heavenly Father, and all they can relate to is the nasty dad they grew up with. So they have a hard time when I'm talking about a loving father, even getting that picture in their minds. But Psalm 139 says, God knew you when you were in your mother's womb. Was everybody here at one point in their mother's womb? Any exceptions here? No? Okay. You all got that one. That was good. You know, God knew who you were in your mother's womb. He had a purpose for you. He knew what your name would be. Even though your arms and your legs and your various parts were not fully formed yet, you were a person. And he knew who you were and what he wanted to do with your life. He says in Psalm 139 that you were fearfully and wonderfully made, which means great preparation went into making you who you are. You know, and you look around the room, we are all different. Doesn't God have a sense of humor? He really does, especially up on the platform, right? You know, and that's the exciting thing about God. He said, I thought it through when I made you, how you'd laugh, what color your hair would be, the color of your eyes, where you'd live, who you'd hang out with, what would make you laugh, what you'd be good at, what you'd struggle with a little bit so that you'd look up and rely on Almighty God. So God doesn't want us to compare, and because of the comparison, look down at our shortcomings. God wants you to realize you're special. You're wonderful. He cares about you. And He wants the best for you in your life. So just a couple of quick points concerning comparison this morning. The comparison trap. First off, comparison will cause you to always do less. If you look back at Luke, the 18th chapter, and verse 12, here is the Pharisee talking. He says, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. I can't hear his tone because it's just on the written page, but he was probably bragging and being somewhat condescending, especially with this tax collector standing next to him. Comparison will cause you to always do less or to center in on the things that are important to you but not necessarily important to God. Sometimes we look around and we get jealous of people, right? And we compare ourselves to other people. Sometimes we don't weigh what they have gone through or how they have worked for what they have in their life to accomplish what they have. I mean that with all my heart. We have this in the ministry. There are more pastors, and uh, I'll say this before I make my remarks, Dan is finishing up his education, which is great. It might take a little while, but that's okay. He's doing it. And that's exciting. He was at the school where I graduated for a while, Boston Baptist College. But there are more pastors in ministry who, bless God, they just didn't have the time to go to school. And if you ask them what school they graduated from, you know what they say? And they all have that raspy voice. Bless God, you know, I graduated from the school of hard knocks. (laughs) Really? What What city is that in? You know? And they're like, God called me into ministry. I didn't need to go. You know, I learned most of what I learned, I have to admit to you, outside of Bible college. You know, I went to Boston Baptist. I did online to finish up Liberty. And it was important to me, even though it was boring sometimes, even though I was just paying my dues, because I thought, one day I'll be in church, and there are people sitting there that are professionals. They went to school. They thought it was important. They got degrees, and that doesn't mean you have to have a degree in order for God to use you, but I think if you look in the Word of God, Paul sat at the feet of Gamaliel, a doctor of the law. In the Old Testament, you see the school of the prophets, and they were training them there. I think we ought to be able to 
pay our dues, the biggest reason? It humbles you. Right? It gives you a teachable spirit when you go the course that God has put before you. I've told you the story. The students in Bible college, they were very antsy about finishing four years to get their bachelor's. They say, what if Jesus comes while I'm still in Bible college? <laughs> I said, well, it'll be okay. Yeah. What, what if I never get married and when Jesus comes or I can't have children or I don't become a grandparent? Well, that'll happen to some people. But trust me, it'll be okay. If Jesus comes and you're taken home to heaven, you won't be whining and complaining up there. It will be okay. He just wants to find you faithful. Okay? And that'll be the most exciting thing. But that's the way we think. Yeah, I believe. Yeah, I'm looking for Christ. Yeah, I know He died for me. But let me do my thing. Leave me alone. Let me live my life. Let me carry on my business my way rather than give our life to Almighty God. So, comparison will always cause you to do less. Do you remember a couple of weeks ago I stood up here talking about giving? Wasn't that an uncomfortable moment? Not for givers. <laughs> right? I was talking about giving. And in Matthew 23, 23, Christ is speaking to the Pharisees, the ones who say, I tithe, I fast, I do this and I do that. And Christ looked at them and said, you are omitting the weightier matters of the law. Yeah, fasting, yeah, tithing, that's minimal. That's stuff you should have done. But when you fall in love with me, and when you realize I was rich but I became poor for your sake, you'll always want to do more. You won't compare yourself with people that are doing less. You'll compare yourself with a God who does everything well. And you'll want to please him in every way possible. So it's important for us to know that. I talked about the letter of the law, the Ten Commandments, versus the spirit of the law. How often did Christ say, but I say unto you, but I say unto you, but I say unto you, and he raised the bar. You would be surprised what you can do in Christ when you look up rather than to the right and to the left and make comparisons. And God will bless you to be able to do that. How are you doing presently in impacting the kingdom of heaven? How are you doing in the spiritual arena? Well, you know, my golf score is a lot lower than it used to be. I'm not asking you that. You know, you should see me bowl. You should see the dancer that I am, the new moves I've learned. I'm into everything, tap and ballet. and Yeah, I know. And God loves that. He made you so you could do that. But how are you doing for Jesus? How are you doing in the spiritual arena? What are we doing to bring a smile to the face of God? Who are we comparing ourselves with? When you look up and make comparison to Jesus, you'll always do more. You'll always do more because it'll break your heart what your Savior did for you. It'll break us and it'll change us. Secondly, comparison will cause us to center in on the non-essentials. And you're going to get mad at me on this one. But give me some time to explain it. Luke 18, 12, again. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. I fast twice in a week, a non-essential. I give tithes of all that I possess a non-essential. Not really that important in God's sight. I know this is going to sound strange, but God doesn't really need your money. The reason He asks us to give is to check out our heart. And for us to show Him that we realize He's taking care of us. What drives you? What motivates you? Human beings are motivated and motivators. I've joked with you in times past, you know, never have I had pets or dogs that when I come home they're laying with their paws behind their head saying, gee, what will I do today? What can I accomplish? You know, how can I make mommy and daddy pleased with me? 
Oh, I just saw your dog run by. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. That was just a joke. <laughs> All right. I never know what's going to happen with my brain, you know. I saw nothing. <laughs> I saw nothing. What goes on in the spiritual arena? I'm glad I got a rise out of you. That's preaching. Amen? What about your priorities? What about your convictions? Convictions are what you're willing to die for. What are you willing to die for? I'm not talking about the things that are non-essentials and not all that important. What about the peril of the world? What about souls dying and going to hell? Let me give you an example. In John, the fourth chapter, does everybody remember the woman of Samaria? The woman at the well. Jesus went to see her. Jesus said, I must go through Samaria. There's a woman there I need to talk to. She wants to know me. She's yearning. She's hungry. Her life is not good. Now, what were the non-essentials that were not important? And the disciples didn't know this. She was a woman. Non-essential. She was a Samaritan woman. Non-essential, but the disciples thought it was pretty serious. She had had five husbands. Non-essential. We're all messed up in one way or another. And Jesus came for the sick. Amen? So it's a non-essential. She came to the well to draw water at noontime, the hottest part of the day, because she was embarrassed and she was ridiculed. All that non-essential. So what was the big picture from the mindset of Jesus? She was lost. She was on her way to hell. She was looking for water that would quench the thirst of her soul. And Jesus said, I have to go see her. Why? To give her advice as to when to draw the water? Come early or it's not so hot? To introduce her to a sixth husband? because she was lonely and frustrated, or to introduce her to himself. We have things in our life that we lift up as important because of comparison, and they are non-essentials. Now here's where you look at me and go, really? Our non-essentials, our finances, non-essential. Important, yes, but not essential. Our health, important, but non-essential. Our job, important, but non-essential. Your rotten boss, non-essential. You need one, you'll have one, but non-essential. Your car, your house. I'm not saying they're not important, but it's not the big picture. The big picture is seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of those non-essentials will be added to you. But we're not that way. We compare. And I need that house, and I need that car, and I need that relationship, and my life is just not right. I'm a failure because look at everybody. When we start looking to God, and we're comfortable with who we are in Christ, it changes things. And God smiles and God brings the other things to fruition that we need. You think God doesn't know what you need? Of course he does. He knows everything that you need. And the big picture is Jesus. That is the big picture. You know, sometimes we look at people who are smiling all the time and we say, they don't go through anything. They have no pain. They don't have any trouble. Maybe they just handle it better than you. <laughs> I dare to say, if we interviewed everybody, they'd give you some heart-wrenching stories. But maybe they're looking to Jesus. Maybe everything happening is a non-essential, and they are content in Christ. And they realize that things can happen, but that doesn't change their position with the Lord. The third thing, 
Comparison will cause you to lift up pride and self. Look at verse 11 of Luke, the 18th chapter. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. How do you pray with yourself? You know, aren't you in trouble if you pray to yourself? If I look in the mirror and I say, Gare, here's what we're going to do today. Here's what I think we need to do. Here are the decisions I'm making. What do you think, Gare? And I'm looking in the mirror and I'm praying with myself and having a discussion. I admit to you, I talk to myself sometimes. Don't you talk to yourself sometimes? (laughs) You know? But this guy is standing there as an example from Christ and he's praying to himself. He's praying to himself, and he, but then he says, God, I'm sure that faked God out. God, I thank you that I am not like other men. Oh, that probably stirred the heart of God. Can you imagine Manny? I, I'm, I'm glad I'm not like Manny. And God says, yeah, that's right. I know what you mean. You know? You, you think that would warm God's heart? No, I don't think so. I think I'd be in a lot of trouble with God and Manny, right? I'm glad I'm not like other men. And then he names the sin, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. This was no prayer to God. He prayed thus with himself. Do you remember in Luke, the 12th chapter, the rich farmer, he had a great crop one year? And so much came in, it wouldn't fit in his barn, so he pulled down his small barn and he built bigger barns. And then he talked to his soul. How do you talk to your soul? God had nothing to do with it. God isn't even mentioned in Luke 12. He talked to his soul. He says, soul? I wonder what the voice came back as. Yeah, You know, soul? You have much goods for many years. You know? Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Have you talked to your soul recently? He had no relationship with God. He was comparing himself with himself, by himself, according to himself. Oh, that's happiness. Listen, not a good thing when we make comparison. Pride and self are lifted up. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 12. Again, for time's sake, you can write it down, look it up. I hope you have a bulletin, you're taking notes. There are three major points out of 2 Corinthians 10, 12. First off, don't compare yourself with those who commend themselves. You ever have people that are always lifting themselves up and patting themselves on the back? Don't compare yourself with them. And then it says measuring themselves by themselves. Hey, life will be good if I'm the standard. You know? If someone says to me, you're not living right, yeah, but I'm pleasing Gary. Gary is happy. Remember in Seinfeld, Jimmy? You know, if I talk about myself in the third person, you know, I mean, that's a little bit sick if I'm going to measure what I'm doing, who I am, by myself. Not a healthy place to be. And then comparing themselves among themselves. You know what God says? They are not wise. We better be careful with comparison because it is an enemy of the heart. Look to Jesus. Compare yourself with Christ and we will always do more. The final thing this morning, comparison will cause you to forget who you are in Christ. Look at verses 13 and 14. Jesus Christ kind of makes the transition and goes to the tax collector. It says, And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast or his chest, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Christ says, Here's the rest of the story. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified. Would Christ know if somebody was justified? He's God. I want to hear Jesus and his take on the matter. This guy was justified. This guy was going to heaven. This guy knew that his business was was with the one above. Almighty God. And not anybody to the right or the left that we might compare ourselves to. He went to his house justified rather than the other. 
For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Who are we in Christ? Again, let me give you parts of 1 Peter 2.9. If you're taking notes, 1 Peter 2.9, we're a chosen generation. We're a royal priesthood. We're a holy nation. We're his own special people. We have been called out of darkness into marvelous light. Psalm 40 in verse 2 says, He brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, set my feet on a rock, and established my goings. Comparison will cause you to forget who you are in Christ. And I want to finish with the story that I gave at the hospital this week. You remember Luke 15? It's the story of the sheep there. Shepherd leaves 99 sheep to go after the one to show how much he loves sinners. The woman had 10 coins and she lost one. And she goes nuts searching for it. She sweeps her house. What's it like when you sweep dirt? They had dirt floors. Probably more difficult to find a coin, but when she found it, she partied, she invited people over. And then there was the prodigal son. The younger son said, Dad, give me what's coming to me. Boy, most dads would love to hear that. Give me what's coming to me. So the father gave him his portion of the inheritance. He took off to a far country and he wasted his money on riotous living, self-medicating, maybe drugs, maybe alcohol, maybe the wrong kind of company and friends. And he runs out of money. And he has no job, so he takes an exclusive position feeding pigs and cleaning pigs, which a young Jewish man would not think was a cool thing as he was there with those pigs, and he got hungry. And he looked down at the corn husks on the ground. There was no more corn on them, and he desired to eat them. You ever do that, a piece of corn so good, and you butter it up and salt and pepper it, the corn's gone, but you keep sucking on it? You know, one of your parents has to say, all right, cool it, you know, because it's getting kind of slurpy, you know. Can you imagine going to Grandma's house and there being no corn on the husk? Wouldn't you say something? Wouldn't you say, this is kind of screwy, Grandma? You know? So suddenly he thinks, this is nuts. The servants back at Dad's house, they get three square meals a day. They have a roof over their head. I'm going home. I'm going to tell my dad that I sinned in his sight. I'm no more worthy to be your son. Just make me one of your servants. I just want to be back with Dad. Dad represented God and a a represented God. He goes back, and as he kind of comes into view, probably hundreds of yards off, Dad must have been sitting on the porch, you know, maybe in his rocking chair, I don't know. Dad's watching for him. You know, all of you, if I could just find God. God hasn't moved. We do. He's in the same place where you left him, okay? God sees him. God takes, his father takes off off the porch runs to him, grabs him, hugs him, kisses him, and he says to his servant, go get a robe. Bring a robe, they put it on his shoulders. Go get a ring. They put the ring on his finger, showing that he belonged, that he was a son. Go kill the fatted calf. We're going to have a feast. We're going to have a party. So they go ahead and do that. And they go inside this big banquet hall and they start partying. Meanwhile, the oldest boy is standing outside and he hears party music going on. He says to one of the servants, what's going on? Oh, your brother has returned. He's back. Why don't you go in and party with them? I'm not going in. The father comes out and petitions the oldest boy. says, why don't you come in and party? He said, Dad... I'm not coming in there with your son. He doesn't call him his brother. He says, with your son. I'm not coming in there. He says, but he was lost and now he's found. Come rejoice with us. And he said, Dad, and all the time we've been together, you never threw a party for me. You never made merry with my friends. And I never did anything wrong. Was that a lie? Do you know any kid who never did anything wrong to their mother or father? Do you? I don't think so. So he lied. 
and he wouldn't go in. And you know what the father said? This is what stuck with me. When I lift up this point, we forget who we are in Christ. The, old, the dad looks at his oldest boy and he says, son, everything I have is yours. Everything. Can't you just come in and party because your lost little brother is back? And we're trying to make happy and trying to make him feel good about himself. And he's learned a valuable lesson. When we compare, we look all around and we forget that all that God has is ours. And he loves us. And when we compare, we make mistakes. And we feel like we're failures and we're losers. And God says, who told you that? Who convinced you of that? God loves you. God has a plan for our life. God cares about us. Comparison is a trap. And we need to realize it. And if you look anywhere, look up. Because when you look into the face of Jesus Christ, you'll always do more. And you'll always know that you're something special in his sight. Let's bow for a word of prayer together. Heads bowed and eyes closed for a moment. I don't know your thoughts. I don't know your heart. When we have invitations at every single service that I've been involved in for over 35 years, I just want you to deal with God right now. Everybody needs a personal relationship with Christ. I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about me saying something and you saying something and you standing and sitting and kneeling and all that stuff. I'm talking about your heart. God made you special for something exciting. And maybe today you don't know Him. You know of Him. But you've never been born again. You've never received Christ into your life. And I'm not even going to look for a response from your seat, but you think about it. It might be a good thing if this happens to be you, that at some point you give me a call or you linger after service and you say, hey, Pastor Garrett, I don't think I'm going to heaven. I don't think I know Christ as Savior. Could we talk about it? That happened to me at 18 years of age. So we'll be praying for that. Maybe you're here today and you'd say, I do a lot of comparing and I realize by today's message it doesn't help me. I need to look to the Son of God. Pray for me this morning. Anybody like that today? I see your hand, brother. I see your hand, dear lady. I see your hand, brother. Anybody else? I see your hand, dear lady. Comparison is a mean, nasty trap. Look to Jesus. And he makes everything right. He frees you. And all he has is yours. Put him first and he'll take care of the non-essential. See, the problem is we're making those things essential. Trust him. Father, we thank you that we are here today. We thank you for your word. And Father, anything that I have not driven home in a way that would be understandable. I pray you just push that aside and help people to center in on what was read from Scripture. Help them to know you love them and you have a plan for them. And that you love them just the way they are, but as we say, you refuse to leave them there. If someone here needs Christ as Savior, Lord, give them the courage at some point to talk about it. And Lord, if we've been making comparison... It is not wise. Help us to look to you. Help us not to pray to ourselves. Help us not to talk to our own soul. Help us to talk to our God through our Savior, Jesus Christ. We love you and we ask it all in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Linda. I have a couple of announcements for you today. That I'm going to read to you, and then we'll go ahead and we'll do something special, and then just close out our service with. Uh,